Yo, this is Tyler Bryant. And Graham Whitford. From The Shakedown. And we're happy to be here with Premier Guitar to talk about the Big Five. My favorite guitar is this uh, Fender Custom Shop 1960 copy. I had one that was almost identical to this, which I, I do have. It's right over there. And we were on the road and it got stolen and was missing for five and a half years. And so in the meantime, you know, my family kind of scraped together. You know, I come from a really hardworking family and they scraped together and, and got me this. And it's it's become my favorite guitar. It's been around the world with me. This pit guard was actually made by a friend um, as a gift to Graham. And it was left in the band van at some point and I found it and put it on my guitar and it's kind of become part of it. But it's, uh, it's a great sounding guitar. I'll show you what it sounds like. <laughs> Show you the original one. This one is the one that was stolen and missing. And um, on the back, Steven Tyler had actually written pink. It's like red, but not quite. And you can still see a couple of little Sharpie marks. And they sanded that off. And we got to one night induct Steve Cropper into the Songwriting Hall of Fame. And I was so in my head about forgetting the lyrics to Midnight Hour in front of him that I'd written them there. And you can still see like just a couple of little marks where the the pin marks were but they sanded it all off but i have it back so that's all that matters it was found at this guitar shop in spokane valley washington called um river city, river city guitars which wasn't too far from where it was going yeah yeah absolutely and um i got a call one day from someone that said can i give your number to this guitar shop they think they have your guitar and it it was found at a used car dealership in spokane and spoke in, how do you say that? And it was kind of traded as a down payment on a used car for like a thousand dollars off on the car. No case. And the owner of the car dealership sent a picture to the guitar shop and th those guys said, that's Tyler's guitar. They they remembered the story and they bought it. They bought it and sent it back to me. I think it was, it was 2016 when I put the humbucker in there. And um, there's this genius of a guy named Tim Shaw who now works at Fender, you know, and he's sort of a famed guitar everything guy and uh he he made this pickup and he put it in there because graham's always had this huge like um this huge like gibson sound and sometimes in a big a big like whenever we went out with acdc i felt like the single coil just wasn't giving me that extra push over the mountain and so that's when i threw the humbucker in there i tried doing all of the single coils that emulate humbuckers and they didn't really do it and whenever tim shaw put this one in there it all just made perfect sense but i couldn't i couldn't bring myself to do that to the original one on my main guitar the humbucker is not splittable i mean i'm sure it could be if you uh tried hard enough but i i just like the way it sounds as it is you know i mean i even i took this one to uh to fender and, and i was comparing a bunch of pickups that would essentially be upgrades and and I just I like the way that this this one sounds and it's so you know how it is sometimes a guitar is like there's so many things you could change about it but why change something if you love it and um, nine times out of ten if I shoot my guitar out with a bunch of other guitars I'll pick mine because I I'm comfortable I know it sound I know what it sounds like I know what it's going to give me I'm comfortable with the way it feels and I'm going to play the best on that i love the volume jump and that's that's something that a lot of people i think get turned off by with going from single coils to humbuckers but i love it because it's you know you can almost simulate kicking on a pedal or something if i'm like The sustain changes, the way the guitar, you know, reacts just changes so significantly. My favorite guitar is this 1958 reissue uh, Les Paul. I think it was built in 2018. I actually found it at Guitar Center in Nashville. Um, it was, it was like kind of way up. And uh, my friend Tony, who's over there, he, he got the ladder out. And I, I was just like, what's that one? You know? And uh, he said, oh, yeah, that's a really good one. It's really light. 
Um, and it was just one of those ones that, I mean, as soon as I felt it, I knew that I loved it. You know, I feel like it usually doesn't take me very long. You know, you feel, you feel, you feel the neck and then you play, play, play it acoustically and you kind of go, okay. It just had that feel um, that spoke to me. My Desert Island album would probably be Wildflowers by Tom Petty. I think that album has a lot of a lot of great moments on it. I mean, every song is a gem. And there's if if I wanted to rock out, I could listen to Honey Bee. If I needed something a little more like bluesy, I could listen to Don't Fade on Me. Then I could listen to Wildflowers in the morning, like as the sun was coming up, and that'd be cool. All the players are great. The songwriting is amazing, and I can't imagine not having a Tom Petty record. To listen to i think if i had one that i had to take it would probably be Jimi hendrix are you experienced some heavier stuff and then it's got like remember which is such a sweet song and um yeah that would that would do it i think my biggest guitar culture pet peeve is that sometimes the gear gets more attention than the playing does i was fortunate enough to spend quite a bit of time on the road supporting jeff beck and i would hear him plug into like a roland cube backstage and it still sounded just like Jeff Beck and I I too like fall into that trap of like I gotta get this pedal I gotta get this amp I gotta do this and really what I think it comes down to is the uh the player and the intention like what what are you putting into that guitar what are you putting into that amp and if you don't have all the pedals how do you get something that's that's memorable with just what you've got that's one thing I do appreciate about Guys like Jack White is like setting limitations for yourself to like bounce around within. One of my uh, guitar culture pet peeves would just be like the overwhelming amount of guitar pedals nowadays. There's a couple of guitar stores in Nashville where I walk in and, and it is just like an unbelievably large wall of guitar pedals. And I'm like, I would have to spend half the day here. And I mean, it's great, uh, you know, and I, I do love pedals, but I just, I feel like I don't even know where to start. What Guitar Hero would surprise fans? When I was about 16, 15 or 16, um, I went and saw John Mayer at Madison Square Garden. I think he had just come out with the Continuum album, and uh, I became very inspired by his guitar playing. It was, yeah, super, very moving to me as a guitar player, so... Um, you know, it's kind of like John's not really a rock guy. So, like, I think, you know, people may be surprised that that was um, a big, he was a inspiration for me as a guitar player, for sure. I'm pretty vocal about loving all sorts of music. I love, like, as far as, like, you know, chicken pickers, I would I would pick, like, Albert Lee is one of my favorites. The other night, I, I went down a rabbit hole of watching Dimebag Daryl videos. I'm not only into the to the blues guys, um, you know, or the classic rock guys. I met Steve Lukather when I was young, and he he said something to me. He said, it, every guitar player has something to teach you, whether they're the worst guitar player you've ever heard or the best guitar player you've ever heard. I always remembered that, you know, even when I hear somebody, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this guy, you know, like someone grabbed that quarter inch, you know. And then, it like, you can always find something positive if, if you – try hard enough let's say i've got a couple um i talked i talked a bunch of crap about guitar pedals a minute ago i would say guitar pedals is one of my <laughs> secret weapons uh i like the the uh i use the i have a, an original Quan that i got years ago back when they were actually 500 bucks and i have um one of the ktr the red the second one second version he made um and there's just something about like the mid-range bite that those pedals have that I feel like it's just become like sort of synonymous with my sound in a way and like whenever I try a different overdrive pedal at least at least the because I usually I keep an overdrive pedal on most of the time and I use my volume as kind of like 
the way to clean it up if I need to. So that that pedal um, has kind of become a bit of a secret weapon for me. Another secret weapon of mine would be um, trying to stay present in the moment while you're on stage. It's real easy to let your mind wander. And I feel like when I let my mind wander, it never works out for me. I, I either screw up or, um, or I'm just not in the moment with the music and I'm not listening. Yeah, just trying to be really present would be, uh, that's something I try to do. Um, I don't know if that's a secret weapon or not, but. My secret weapon, let's think about this. I think from like a gear perspective, there's an overdrive pedal that I've had forever. It's been on every Shakedown record. Logan, who was our guitar tech for years, found it on a forum. It was this guy out of Germany that made this pedal and he got one and he loaned it to me and I never gave it back to him. And I convinced the guy to make a couple of modifications to it and call it the TB drive. It's a, you know, a dual overdrive pedal and it allows me to get, you know, the kind of sustain that I like here, I'll, I've got it going now. I'll show you like without the, uh, without the pedal on, this is my signal with one channel with both. So that's a pedal that like, I just, I take everywhere. I run my resonators through it. Like we went out and did an acoustic tour and I was running my acoustic through it. It's just a sound that I love gear aside. One of my secret weapons, uh, would be the attitude in which I approach things with sometimes it's like, it's so easy to get hung up on your own insecurity or your anxiety, especially I get so much anxiety before we go out on a, on stage. And it's like, you're sitting there going, Oh man, how am I going to do it? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And then as soon as you go out and you, have to, you know, you are the guy in charge whenever you're playing. And I, and I think that's something that I really do appreciate and try to, try to harness because it helps me like um sort of like get over my own insecurities and then by the you know halfway through the first song you're cooking with gas you know just kind of trying to harness the, the fact that you are the boss whenever you're doing this and just putting all of your intention into what you're playing even if you hit the wrong thing if you did it with intention you know then it's better than hitting the wrong thing with no intention mm -hmm.